So um, my name is Kathleen Zegda. I'm the Director of Community Research and Evaluation at the Public Health Institute of Western Massachusetts. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. Um, so as some of you are probably aware, we um, uh, do a bit of work related to data and we've created the Western Mass COVID data dashboard that we have up on our, West, our website as a way to try and make data more accessible to um, our communities throughout Western Massachusetts. Um, we use data from the state, but it, um, there, there's quite a bit of data. And so we, we put this up as a way to have what we think are the most important data for people to be able to see um, both at the county and community level. So um, as part of that work, we've been convening a, um, a regional advisory group and um, including Berkshire Regional Planning Council or Commission, um, Franklin Regional Council of Governments, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, um, Collaborative for Educational Services, Town of Ware as representatives, and then also um, one of our board members who was a Springfield resident and formerly um, deputy director of the Springfield um, Health and Human Services uh, for our dashboard. And uh, when the metrics were changed for community risk categorization um, a little while ago, a couple of weeks ago, there are a number of questions that came up. Um, the group has been really um, amazing and thinking through different things our communities need. And so we thought it would be helpful to discuss the metrics um, and share through a webinar and, and talk through some of what they mean and also some of the things that have arisen. So, so for today, um, we're please um, stay muted as I mentioned for early on, um, just in terms of Zoom procedures. Uh, please, if you have any questions, put them in the chat and we will answer them during a Q&A session at the end. Um, so I would like to go ahead and introduce and turn it over to our moderator for the day, our board member, Josh Garcia. Josh? Yep, I'm here. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Zeta. Um, hold on, I wanna do a quick introduction. And okay. so Josh is a practicing public administrator with a focus on community development, public management, and good governance. Um, in his former professional roles and now as the town administrator at the town of Blandford, Josh is dedicated to improving the quality of life for all residents. When he's not working and contributes his professional experience to the development of his hometown, the city of Holyoke. He served as an elected representative on the Holyoke School Committee and he serves on local and regional community development boards, initiatives and committees. And he is also a mayoral appointed member of the fire commission for the Holyoke Fire Department. Josh is also a 2015 Business West 40 under four recipient. So thank you so much for being willing to be here today and moderate uh, for us, Josh. Oh, I'm great, I'm happy to help and thank you so much for including me. And uh, hello everybody, I'm Josh Garcia, the town administrator at a small town, town of Blanford also a member of the Board of Directors of the Public Health Institute of Western Massachusetts. And on, I first wanna welcome you all and thank you kindly for taking your time and participating today um, in this webinar to discuss and understand the updated metrics released by the Commonwealth. So we as leaders within our individual profession and, uh, and capacities can carry out our objectives while effectively navigating the COVID environment today based on data and other information we know uh, that we did not know back in March when all of this uh, started. Um, I do wanna give a quick shout out here to my colleagues on the board who are with us, uh, Laura Wondolowski, as well as Tim Sneed. Uh, thank you kindly for participating uh, with us here. So as town administrator, just like many of you in general, we're hired to perform risk management and everything we do as it relates within our individual organizations and capacities. Uh, we do what we can to reduce harm, improve the quality, quality of life in all of our projects, and we do it within the limitations available to us. And certainly none of us uh, were prepared to handle COVID. And you can imagine for a small town like Blanford, with only a population of about 1,200 residents with limited staff capacity, limited budget capacity, it brings a unique set of challenges comparatively to our larger communities. Uh, you know, but just like everybody else, no protocols, no practices, procedures, very restrictive budget for the fiscal year. Um, and our operations are confined by what's allowed by mass general laws. And for us and for many communities, it was extremely helpful to see the Commonwealth step up the way they did by providing flexibility to the laws, flexibility in how we operate as a municipality and manage our budgets. 
and made available funding to our local boards of health to help supplement COVID related expenses, which was big for us because in a small town, unlike larger communities that can hire directors and, and board of health agents, uh, we have a three member volunteer board of health, but thankfully I have a very dedicated uh, group and we've been working strongly together and navigating, uh, navigating what's in front of us. Um, so it was, uh, it, it, it was helpful and uh, also just how the state has been coordinating information sharing of data, best practices overall has been important for local leaders that are in the trenches working with what they have to make better decisions and how we all operate to meet our obligations while within this environment. So from September to date, we're, we're up to 15 in Blanford, which in our perspective don't seem like much, but compared to what we have witnessed everywhere else, uh, it was enough though to put us in the red prior to the changes in the metrics. And, uh, now with the new metrics, we're no longer in a red, but even though that might be the case, uh, COVID recognizes no borders in the town. We do what we have to do to, to, to contribute toward helping with, what, with uh, keeping our community safe. So the issue of COVID, like I said, no borders, and we understand it's all of our responsibility and it's moment like this webinar, moments like this webinar and hearing from organizations like members that are on this panel representing local and regional public health, healthcare leaders and legislative leaders as well about how they are addressing uh, COVID using data, the risk categorization metrics and health communication and what we need to think about moving forward so that folks like myself and many of you that are here today with us can continue to understand the situation uh, and make the necessary adjustments so we can continue our jobs but also do so in ways that are keeping our community safe uh, just until you know we can find uh, a working vaccine here. So, um, so moving forward, uh, will that will be followed? So we, you know, after we hear from our panel members, um, we will have 15 minutes for a Q and A period. Uh, on our panel includes Dr. Kathleen Zegda from the Public Health Institute of Western Mass. We have here also State Representative Mindy Dom. Third Hampshire District. Thank you, uh, Representative Dom. Laura Kitross from the Berkshire Regional Planning Council. Jasmine Neeler uh, from the Caring Health Center, and uh, Phoebe Walker from Franklin Regional, uh, from the Franklin Regional Council of Governments. Uh, so, with that, I'm going to pass it to uh, Kathleen to take it from here with the moderators. I mean, with the uh, panel members. Thank you. Thank you very much, Josh. So, so I'm going to start and, and speak a little bit to the metrics and then we'll hear from our panel members about various um, aspects about how they're using data, COVID data, the risk categorization metrics and health communication and, and what we need to think about moving forward. So I am going to pull up some information. So so on, um, as many of you I'm sure are aware, so this data has been using um, a risk categorization um, for how to categorize communities in terms of their risks related to COVID. And so on November 6, the governor announced that they would be, um, the state would be changing their risk categorization metrics. And so um, there are a number of questions that came from that and, um, I've included here a link to the, um, the um, governor's update on that. And so these are the metrics as they, as they were newly released. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how they've changed and um, what they mean um, and how they're, what's used to um, calculate risk now. Um, I did speak to the state epidemiologist, infectious disease epidemiologist, and she conveyed her um, apologies for not being able to, to be here and do this herself. Um, but consistent with what we're hearing from the governor, the, um, the Mass Department of Public Health looked at other metrics that were being used and they looked across other states and also at the WHO and CDC recommendations. And so, Based on what they um, found, 
um, they created these new metrics and they're more consistent with what was being done in some of those other places and then also with the recommendations. One thing that was different um, when examining was that Massachusetts had conservative metrics for calculating risk. And so um, that in and of itself is not a bad thing, but um, I think in looking at, I mean, our, our understanding of COVID and risk and how we use that information has changed over the course of this pandemic. And I think um, what people are trying to figure out is what makes the most sense given differences in different size communities and also um, in terms of what we should be doing based on these on the risk metrics. And again, our, what we learned has changed over the course of the pandemic. Um, so these are more in line with what the metrics are that are being used currently. And so um, there were also challenges with the previous metrics because they used incidence rate per 100,000 primarily for small communities and then also um, an absolute count of new cases in the last 14 days. And it just wasn't working great for small, smaller communities. For example, there um, a community uh, here in Western Mass, one example was West Hampton that was red. And I believe they were red based on five cases just because their population size was so small. And um, that does not necessarily mean community spread. And so people were trying to reconcile what to do with that. So. So under the current metrics, they use a variety of different, um, several different um, indicators to determine what the risk level is. And so you can see one of the things that's different is it's more nuanced now for population size. Um, so now they take into account if communities are under 10,000, 10,000 to 50,000 and over 50,000. And then they also are using um, similar to before, as part of this, a um, absolute new case number in the last 14 days. So again, this is the last 14 days, average, day, um, well, this would be cases in the last 14 days. And um, so new case numbers, in addition, they're using the incidence rate. So you'll see, for example, under green, um, less than 10 average cases per day per 100,000. So that's um, was being used before in the previous and it continues to be. And then also now they're taking into account um, positive test rate. So that's being used, for example, in New York and um, all of these things together for the state of New York and their metrics were developed with national, um, rec nationally recognized infectious disease epidemiologists who are um, experts in these areas. So um, test positivity rate gives a sense of both um, the potential community spread, um, but it's also dependent on the number of tests being conducted and whether or not um, asymptomatic testing is being done. So it's also a way to assess whether we have testing capacity for sufficient testing capacity for contact tracing. So now you'll see here for some of the higher risk category and amongst um, communities where it's 10,000 or higher, they are taking into account the positive test rate as well. So here's just an example of, I just pulled a few different examples. The state released new data yesterday. So I pulled the data based on that for um, communities throughout Western Mass and from the various counties, just to show people how this would be calculated and what this would look like. So um, one thing to keep in mind, just in terms of the, um, the risks categories here. So we know that red is the highest risk and of concern. Um, the way when I was speaking to the state epidemiologists yesterday about how they look at this, it's really more um, increasing levels of transmission. So gray would be the lowest levels of transmission, green would be um, you're seeing more levels increasing into yellow, and then red where it's most concerning um, at, in terms of the number in this categorization. So you'll see, um, I pulled here population size. So these are the population size counts that the state is using. They're 2019 estimates developed by the Donahue Institute. And so um, projections. And so I pulled those. And so you can see, for example, Orange, um, the community of Orange, which is in Franklin County. So their population size would fall under the 10,000 
and they have fewer um, than 10 cases, so they are gray. Here's an example of a green community. So from Berkshire, um, 13,000 population size approximately. And so it'd be under the 10 to 50,000. Um, and then to this would be where there's, um, let's see, less than 10 average cases um, per 100,000 and greater than 10 total cases. So you see that Northampton from um, Hampshire County would fall. So here again, under 10 to 50,000. So these criteria for yellow is greater than equal to 10 average cases. You see it's 11 and their positivity or their positivity rate is greater than equal to 5%. So here it's 1%. And then red, so um, from Hamden County, um, we have Springfield. And so for them, it's the combination of greater than or equal to 10 average cases per um, 100,000 in daily cases in the last um, 14 days and a, a positive rate greater than or equal to 5%. So for people to be able to access this data, I'm sure some of you see it in the newspaper. I just wanted to share um, as well. It is all the, um, when the newspapers have it and we also put it up on our website as well. Um, it's from the state's weekly um, COVID-19 public health rep report. It's released on Thursday. I've included the link here. And then what we do at the Public Health Institute is we take this data and then um, it's available both on our main COVID-19 data page, but we also have it on the um, county pages. And um, we have uh, in a spreadsheet for by county the, um, the new case data in the last 14 days over time, and then also the incidence rate per 100,000 over time, and you can see the color coding in there as well. So just to give a sense, I pulled based on the data that was released yesterday for each of the counties. So this is an example of what we have on our website. And so these are the new cases. Um, sorry, this is supposed to say new cases in the last 14 days here for Berkshire. But you can see in Berkshire County that um, so generally gray, and then with some communities that are in the are green risk category in yellow. Um, in Franklin County, generally gray as well. Some communities in the green from Franklin. I should mention the state used to put um, a map on their website that would make it so you could visualize this. They took that down when they changed to this categorization method. And then my understanding is that they are not planning to put it back up at this time. And then for the other counties in Western Massachusetts, so for Hamden County, you can see that there it has been more transmission um, and that there are um, a number more yellow and red communities. And then for Hampshire County, um, you can see that we have um, kind of in between um, with some green and yellow communities as part of that. So that's just a quick overview of the new metrics, some of the reasoning behind it, how they're calculated. And what I'm gonna do it now is turn it over to um, our panelists to speak. And so first I will turn it over to, um, we'll hear from our local um, and regional public health um, people who are present and hear more about what they're doing in their region related to COVID and how people are using the risk metrics. So first we'll hear from Berkshire County and Laura Kittross. So Laura is, as Josh mentioned, the public health program manager for the Berkshire Regional Planning Commission and the director of the Berkshire County Boards of Health Association and the Berkshire Public Health Alliance. So Laura, um, thank you so much for being here. And can you please tell us a little bit about the communities you serve and, and describe your role in working with local boards of health in your region to address COVID? And also, can you share some about how you and your communities are using the risk metrics and or data in your work? Sure. Um, hi, everybody. It's great to be here today. Um, I am actually sitting in my living room, not in Ireland, but I thought it would be 
more interesting for people to see Ireland behind me and remember days when we could travel places. Um, so I think most of you are probably familiar with Berkshire County. We are mostly very small towns, 75% uh, of which are under the size of 2,500. We do have one larger, well, for us, a larger city, Pittsfield, which contains about uh, a third of the population in Berkshire County, and then a much smaller city, um, North Adams, which you already saw highlighted, which is about 13,000 people. Um, and I think that we find the, that local boards of health and local health departments find the metrics helpful for a couple of reasons. Um, it's very easy to get caught up in what's going on in your community and to be able to put it into a larger perspective, to be able to see how it compares to other parts of the, the state and other parts of the county, um, to get a better idea of what's really going on. Um, and I think a lot of us are quite visual and that I, I miss the map. I wish they would put the map back because I did find that useful. And as um, Josh Garcia said in the beginning, none of us are an island. Um, you know, it, it, it's important to know what's going on in the towns. Um, I'm paraphrasing, but it's important to know what's going on in the towns next to us and near us, as well as what's going on in our own small town. Um, and I think the metrics have also been really useful for boards of health as a way to direct members of the public who are concerned, who want to know how their town is doing, um, how um, you know surrounding towns are doing, how the county is doing, to have a place to direct people so that they can look. Um, I know that the health agents and the public health nurses who are all flat out right now find it a useful way to um, direct their board of health members um, to those metrics. Um, so I, I think they've been a really useful tool that way. Um, I do want to talk just very briefly about, you know, being careful, though, that we don't start looking at those metrics as the be all and end all. Um, they tell a really important story, but they don't tell the entire story. Um, so it's really important for us when we see our town go from gray to green or from green to yellow or from yellow to red to say what's really going on there. Is this a sign of community transmission um, or is it a sign of, you know, two large families got together and had a gathering and really it's contained there? Is it in a long term care facility that we're seeing these cases? Is it um, among a certain segment of the population? Is it in some other sort of institution? Um, so I, I really regret that in, in some cases, towns are using these metrics as um, the only piece of data or one of the only pieces of data to do things like close schools. Um, you know, just because a town has gone to yellow certainly means that you need to look at this and figure out why the town has gone to yellow. But are we seeing transmission in the school? Are we seeing transmission in restaurants or in businesses? Um, and to really try to pinpoint what's to use it as a tool to nudge you to try to figure out what's really going on in your town and to mitigate where the real risk is um, rather than um, reacting in some kind of knee jerk reaction um, or in a reaction that you thought was going to be the right thing to do. Um, so, you know, just saying that, you know, different a different scenario will have a different response. If you have an outbreak in a, in a nursing home, then you want to respond differently than if you have an outbreak in the school. So I think my time is probably up. So I'll let somebody else talk now. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, I think you raised really excellent points. It was great to hear um, how um, communities in the Berkshires and that you work with are using the metrics, but also the um, how important it is to consider context and those metrics don't tell the whole story and how important that is to really think about um, some of those other things that you so um, articulately described. So next, um, we're going to hear from Franklin County. And so we're going to hear from Phoebe Walker. Phoebe is the Director of Community Services at the Franklin Regional Council of Governments. Um, she's involved in public health program design, evaluation, and implementation in Franklin County um, for over 25 years. Um, Ms. Walker has worked on regional local public health collaboration, substance use disorder, disorder prevention and intervention, chronic disease prevention, and a wide variety of municipal governmental policy and staffing issues. Um, she works to improve public health on a countywide basis in the Commonwealth's most rural county and serves on numerous regional and state advisory groups. Thanks for being here, Phoebe. Um, so Phoebe, can you tell us a little about the communities you serve and describe your role in working with local boards of health in your region to address COVID? Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, so hi, I work in Franklin County, which is uh, northernmost and most rural community in, um, 
in Massachusetts, and many of you are from there, hello. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm here in sort of a couple hats. One is we do run a regional health district um, that uses these metrics as a way to inform ourselves and our boards of health about how we're doing. And then secondly, I serve as the state's COVID affiliate like Laura does for Berkshire County in, um, in Franklin County, which means that I try to provide support to local governments um, in responding to the pandemic. And so that can be, we gather together with all of our school nurses pretty regularly um, every two weeks. And we gather with uh, regional uh, and local health agents every few weeks. And then we have an every other week um, COVID round table for pretty much any municipal person of any kind who would like to come and talk about what's new in state government guidance around COVID because for sure every two weeks there's something new. Uh, <laughs> so um, just, and we always start out by taking a look at the Public Health Institute's website um, to sort of look at what is the Franklin County picture um, right now. So, a couple of things I wanted to say about the metrics. Initially, I was of course suspicious. Anytime someone changes what the rules are for rural communities, I get a little defensive on behalf of our small towns. To have a different system for towns under 10,000, that's like half the towns in Massachusetts probably. So, but um, Kathleen was helpful in analyzing the data and, and, um, and I, I think this one is actually better. Um, uh, it was not very useful before, frankly. You could have literally one family of four and one old person get COVID and an entire town would go from gray to red. And, um, and, the, and the optics of that were terrible for the, that town. Um, so I do like this one better. Um, I would really love to see um, the color change. I find it bizarre to imagine that gray is somehow on a scale and then green is somehow better than worse than gray, but it's green, you know? So anyway, I have requested at the state that they consider going to um, orange, you know, yellow, orange, red, green, yellow, orange, red, instead of this random gray, which as people may recall, the gray was a request because originally it was white. Um, uh, so that has already been, they've been tinkering with it. Um, I wanted to address um, Laura's point about the map. I think many of us really liked that map, bookmarked it, looked at it, liked to hover over it and see things, but I, and I liked the easy, easiness of finding it, but it gave a really false sense that, that somehow a border around a town can mean anything. And in particular in Western Mass, where so many of our towns are, you know, 2,000 people, 1,500 people, 300 people, the idea that there is any meaningful thing to say about a town of that size um, was really underscored by that map because you would hover over it and you would pit your town against another town and see how your town was doing when your kid probably goes to a regional school and you probably work three towns over. So it was not that, um, in that way it wasn't helpful and probably weeding us all off of it is good. Um, a couple other things I was asked I think to speak about is what happens when a town turns red um, in this current structure. And uh, the state does have a bunch of resources that are available to red communities that involve the, um, they're actually available to any community if they pitch hard enough that they want it, but, but um, in particular for communities that are seeing an escalation, um, it includes testing for clusters through schools and workplaces. Um, there's the stop the spread sites. Right now there's no plan to make new ones, but, um, but there could be if, if things got bad. Um, there's support from the contact tracing collaborative can come in and do kind of community information sessions that has a lot of public messaging people can use, um, that you can, you can use now, just change the name of the town that it's on there. Um, the Department of Labor Standards is willing to come out and work with particularly recalcitrant work in, workplaces. Um, apparently they're working with Home Depot uh, and Cumberland Farms very closely. Um, and uh, the ABCC can also come out and help with liquor licenses, licensees that are not following rules. And then there's a lot of education um, and infographics and things like that, that we could all be using if we can find it easily on the website and customize it for our own use. So there are a lot of things that are available to communities who start to see themselves move along that um, spectrum. And um, I guess I just wanted to say one other way in which the new metrics are being used in a same, similar way to the old one is for school closure discussions. And shout out to the folks from Frontier who are here today. Um, I know that they have a very good um, 
uh, set of metrics that a lot of people use as examples um, when thinking about school opening and closure and they, their nurse leader did recently update it to take into account this new, um, the new, this new metrics. I know that the superintendent and nurse leader are here. So, and I think that's probably all I have time to say. Thank you so much, Phoebe. And um, I appreciate the, the thought you give to how all of these metrics and apply to smaller communities. And so um, I think um, researching, it pushed us to research what and how it, it applied in some of the models it was drawn upon, so. Well, I'm so grateful for your guys' map because you're, you're not your map, but your daily, you know, your sort of infographic that I can send people to and say, do not get obsessed about what is going on at the individual town level. Look at the big picture uh, from the Institute's Franklin County page. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much, we appreciate that. So next we're going to hear from Jasmine Naylor um, and hear from a healthcare perspective and risk perspective. Um, we've talked a little bit in risk communication about how the metrics are used and, and even they're like a visual representation of, of risk to the community. Um, but we know that it's important to, to think about how information is communicated in general. So Jasmine Naylor is the Chief Executive Vice President and Privacy Officer of Caring Health Center. She joined the Community Health Center movement in 2015 after serving in corporate America for 11 years at a division of United Technologies Corporation, where she managed high profile multi-million dollar contracts, recovered hundreds of thousands of dollars in at-risk revenue, and develop profitable process improvements. Ms. Naylor has an impeccable record of training and developing talent and is a highly motivated natural problem solver, solver and extremely detail oriented. She transitioned from focusing on planes in the sky to the heart of her community so she could have a greater impact and influence. So thank you so much for being here, Jasmine. So as I was saying, the risk metrics are a way for community residents to understand the risk in their community. Um, Caring Health Center, and has been, and you have been involved in efforts to understand how prevention messaging and risk may best be communicated to um, residents and, and patients in the Springfield area, um, which is currently categorized as a red community. From hearing directly from your patients at Her Caring Health Center about what they think would be effective, can you share some of what you learned and your thoughts on that, Jasmine? Yes, thank you for having me. So um, Caring Health Center found um, the information that our patients share with us, very intriguing. Um, but also I just wanna step back, there was a comment in the chat box from Dr. Frank Robbins mentioning uh, the differentiation of the data based on neighborhood and who's uh, more highly impacted versus other communities. There are a lot of red communities in Springfield, but there are a lot of greens as well. But um, Caring Health Center serves a predominantly diverse community. So we serve patients in over 35 different languages. So when we're looking to respond to this pandemic and to being able to facilitate a conversation with our patients on how to best serve them in this pandemic, we have to look at things from the lens of 35 different languages, not just one language. So most of the time, the data that's being shared is being shared in one language, maybe two language, languages. Very rarely is it shared in multiple languages. So what Caring Health Center did working with our marketing and public relations department, as well as our research and public health department, was making sure that we provided helpful videos that broke down the information in the language that best suited our patients. So we broke them down into, I want to say, about 10 different languages so that our community uh, at Caring Health Center that lives in the greater Springfield area was getting information that reached them in the language that they understood it. Um, so that was one of the big things that we did. The other things that we did as well was uh, certain communities were harder hit than others in the beginning. Um, and even now, based on how the data has come out, uh, in particular, the Russian community was impacted very heavily. And um, we have a provider that is very well known in the community. So we utilize that relationship to have her communicate information to the very pockets uh, that were being devastated by this um, virus. Uh, so that was very key and critical to try to get different folks to understand whether it was churches, whether it was communities that were meeting together, to try to get them to change and, and adjust their behavior as this pandemic was getting worse. Um, the other thing that we've also done is having conversations with our employees. A lot of our employees are actually patients and predominantly um, live in the greater Springfield area as well. So making sure that they're continually informed because mostly almost all of us have 
folks that are patients. We, we are patients ourselves. Um, so understanding the value that they hold in delivering messaging was very key. So we had implemented weekly town halls with them and kept them current about the data, the information, and tried to break it down in as simple term as, terms as possible so that they could also be a light beam within the community so they could educate folks as well about what was going on. Uh, the other thing to consider as well is with our communities, especially the populations we serve, is uh, folks live in multi-generational households. So things that might work in more affluent communities in terms of just stay home, just uh, stay with your immediate family is a very different term and very different concept for other folks um, in our community and our population because they might have two, three, or four generations living together. So it's not so easy just to stay to yourself. Your inner uh, community is much more in that household, just much more than one family, you know, a mother, a father, uh, uh, a child, two child, and a dog. It looks very different. So understanding um, the impact of that and giving strategies and ideas to our patients on how to pet, best keep themselves safe. We're really thankful to the Community Foundation who gave us uh, multiple funding sources so that we could provide some resources to our patients uh, that was extremely helpful, especially for those communities, our refugee population, um, who didn't necessarily have the basic things that they needed to withstand this pandemic. So understanding things from that viewpoint has, very, has been very important and we've done a lot of things um, in order to help our patients in that way. The other things we've done also are social media posts. If you follow us on Facebook, Caring Health Center, you will see that we continuously put up information. And if we need to duplicate it, which again, information needs to be duplicated, um, we, re re we repost things and share other postings that are valid and accurate. Um, so that folks could also be reached via the social media realm. And we've seen our reach in our social media numbers has increased, so we uh, believe that this has been an effective method as well, communicating with our patients and getting information out. Last thing I'll say is we're also testing out text messaging technology with our um, patients. Uh, because it's another tool to be able to use. So that is how we are confirming appointments. And also we're looking at ut utilizing that um, as an effective way when confirming as well to give other tidbits of information that may be helpful and can help stop the spread as well. So lots of different things going on at Caring Health Center to help our patient population. Thank you so much, Jasmine. Um, I know Caring Health Center does such fantastic work in thinking from really a patient-centered approach and, and what works best across the many diverse populations you work with. So it was great to hear all of the different modes you guys are using thoughtfully to reach your patients on this. I think you also raised a good point that um, Dr. Frank Robinson had put in the chat as well about the fact, so we talked a bit about our rural communities, but Western Mass is diverse. And so what about our more urban and larger communities where the metric doesn't necessarily work as well and you really need to look at um, more granular level at um, uh, neighborhoods within, within the community as well, or it's really important when you think about addressing COVID. So, so thank you. Welcome. So next, we're going to hear from State Representative Mindy Dom. So um, Mindy is the State Representative for the 3rd Hampshire District, including Amherst, Pelham, and Precinct 1 in Granby. Prior to, prior to taking elected office, she was the Executive Director of the Amherst Survival Center, where she oversaw the delivery of a range of free basic needs programs. Prior to that, she worked on the HIV epidemic since the 1980s overseeing testing in Western Massachusetts, providing community education, pressuring for a federal response to the epidemic, working with people in jail, substance users, and drug and alcohol treatment providers. Thank you for being here. So now that we've heard about the risk metrics and how they are being used by local regional public health and also um, healthcare providers, and what we are learning about community risk, we'd like to hear um, from you, Mindy, and your thoughts on using the risk metric data and data in general to support local and regional efforts to address COVID from a legislative perspective and your perspective as a legislator. Thank you so much. And I wanna thank the Public Health Institute of Western Mass, um, not only for sponsoring today's webinars and other webinars, but for all the work you're doing to make sure that we get information on the pandemic and that we get it in a county-based way as well as a regional-based way. I hope everybody on this webinar has checked out the Institute's dashboard for Western Massachusetts. It's probably the only place in the state right now where you can actually access, readily access countywide data, which I'll get to in a moment, um, because I think that is problematic. 
but I really wanna express my gratitude for your work on this. Um, so my background um, in the HIV world has really sort of informed my response to the data in the COVID-19 world. Um, I often said, and I may have said in a prior um, webinar that, you know, if a tree falls in the forest, um, does it make a sound, right? We've also, we've all heard this philosophic, uh, philosophical question. And for me, epidemiology really amplifies the sound of that tree falling in the forest so that the whole community can hear what's going on, the Commonwealth can understand what's going on, and we can create um, policies and make decisions that are based on the reality of those trees falling down in our forest. Um, and so I look at data not only as a way to drive decisions, which I hope it does, but also as a way to invest communities in those decisions. But that can really only happen when we are educating and communicating with community members about what the value of that data is, um, what it means, and how it can be applied. And so a lot of what I've been working on on the state level has been trying to move the state to begin to look at their reports through those lenses, that it's not just enough, although it's great that they generate a lot of data, but they need to do it in a way that communities can understand not only what the data means and what it's reflecting, but how they can use it and how they can, um, what decisions, specific kinds of data should be able to help them to make and how they should think about it. I don't think as a state, we've done a very good job at that. I think we've done a pretty good job of generating a lot of information, um, but the administration I don't think has done a very good job of doing the community education piece that I think should accompany the data. So that's the first piece of um, where I see the data affecting policy is I think we need to do a better job of connecting those dots for our communities. And when I say our communities, I'm not only talking about our health officers um, and our select boards or our uh, mayors, but I'm really talking about community members as individuals, families, teachers, um, school committee members to really draw lines between here's this data piece, here's what it represents, and here's the kind of information and decisions it could be informing. I'd like us to be doing more on that um, so that data is not only driving our decisions, but it also is helping us um, engage communities in those decisions and in practicing the behaviors that we're asking people to do. So we talk a lot about um, COVID fatigue and people feeling that they um, have they practiced enough prevention or they're trying to figure out how to assess their own risk for prevention. Um, and it's hard. And we're not, I don't think that the state is doing um, a good enough job at helping people figure out how to answer those questions for themselves and their communities. And I think that may be reflected in some of the stresses that we see in certain communities around school openings and school closings. Um, I was so thrilled to hear Dr. Zegna say that she got someone from DPH to say that the color coding on the, the risk map or the risk categories is about the level of transmission that's happening in those communities because I think that may be the first time I've actually heard that, um, that the color reflects the level of transmission. Um, but that's a great way of thinking about it because now people can kind of understand that's what's happening in your general community. Let's find out where. So that kind of dovetails to what Laura was talking about. What is that, what does that transmission rate look like? What's the setting that it's happening in? What are the real risks? Not just your red, you know, get into your houses and bolt your doors, but what does it really mean? We really need to do a better job at that. And I'm disappointed in the state that we haven't done that. I'm, I'm pressing, but um, I'm disappointed. And now, you know, there's always, when you're in the midst of a pandemic, a really good excuse for not doing things like that is we're busy <laughs> um, and they are busy. But I think that we have to get down to the business of um, investing our communities in the importance of the data so that they can make the best decisions possible. And it also, I, I know it will help with risk reduction because I saw that um, in the HIV uh, epidemic. Um, as an HIV educator, I took time to be able to talk about the epidemiology, what it meant, what it didn't mean. And it helped people wrap their heads around the ways in which the risk was present in their own lives and how they could practice risk reduction. So I think it's definitely doable. We just have to make sure we do it. I I've have I've, legislation that I have not yet introduced 
um, to require the state to provide countywide data. And one reason I didn't introduce it was because the Public Health Institute provided it for Western Mass. So I was able to get a little bit of cover on that to be able to get the information through your dashboard. But that's becoming more and more, uh, increasingly more important to do for my colleagues who live in other parts of the state because they have been reaching out to me around that. I've also asked for reports on the Stop the Spread sites. We have the Stop the Spread program going on um, throughout the state. We haven't asked as much information about the people who are going there as I think we need to, to be able to understand why people are using them. And we haven't yet gotten a report from the Department of Public Health on what the level of infection is in those sites, and what the zip codes are, You know, how many Hampshire people are going to Hamden. Um, so I hope that we can continue to generate this data because this data becomes the, the way that um, the legislature gets motivated to act. Um, information should compel action and data is part of that information. I think I probably went over my time, so I'll shut up. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Dom. Um, such important points in thinking about how we use data effectively and to be able to engage communities and communicate what needs to happen. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Josh and he will moderate our Q&A. I guess for those who have questions, I mean, I, there are a few that were asked. I've been keeping track of folks that have asked questions out in the chat, in which some have been answered. Um, one of which, and, and if you do have a question, you can please continue to place it here in the chat, or I guess raise a little hand um, uh, uh, emoji there. But I, Kathleen, one question here that was directed to you, any thoughts about why the percent positive was not used for towns under 10,000? So um, I think that's a great question. And I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I can say that when I was looking at other models, so that's the first thing I did and the models that were referenced, um, when I looked at New York's, which was done again, um, in consultation with the national infectious disease experts. So, um, like, like I trusted how they were doing it. And they also um, had minimum um, like case counts for smaller communities before they would even consider like add in those additional um, metrics to consider. So I, I'm not sure um, why particularly, but I think, um, you know, part of this is just understanding the number and whether that's um, community spread or not community spread, just given it's a small community. Um, but I'm not exactly sure. I think it's a great question, PB. Okay. Uh, another question here. Uh, what do the different panelists feel are the best guidelines for when public schools should be offering on-site education, especially elementary schools? Panel members, anyone want to take a jump on that? I can just share some of the discussion. Um, I can start. And we've had some discussion in our COVID dashboard advisory group. Um, I mean, it's a, really, it's a really tough question. And I think there are many things to consider. I think, um, you know, everyone wants to, wants children to be in school as much as they can be and have as um, make it as safe as possible for children and staff in the schools. So I think that's what everyone's goal is for this. Um, I think there's a lot of contextual issues um, that Laura had raised in terms of considering um, the data that's out there. So that metric is just a metric. And so there's other things to look at um, when you're thinking about whether or not there is transmission particularly that is happening within the schools. And so that's the question that we're trying to understand. Um, the governor has stated that they're, they're seeing little transmission in the schools and some of the data does suggest that. However, um, as we said in our advisory group, um, we, we need to watch as there's more community spread. And so that's gonna be really critical um, as we do this. And so I don't know if others have anything to add? So I had put my response into the, the chat and I won't repeat that except to reiterate that um, I think it's important as public health professionals to balance um, keeping everyone safe from COVID along with there's a lot of negative impacts of children being out of school. They've now been out of school at least in part for nine months. Um, and while remote learning is done 
most schools have learned how to do that a thousand times better than they knew how to do it when they were sudden, it was suddenly thrust upon them in March or April of last year. And for the most part, teachers are doing a fabulous job with that. We all know it's not a substitute for in-person learning. And we know that there's health and mental health um, impacts to children being out of school um, at all levels from kindergarten through 12th grade. Um, so I just think that, you know, we need to make intelligent, informed decisions and not react just based on fear or just based on numbers in terms of, of kids going back to school. And were there any other panel members? If I can say one thing on this. Um, I think that the context that's being described is super important. It's not only the context for transmission, it's also the context which communities were um, being told they could take, they could make these decisions, right? So that initially in the summer it was come up with three plans and see where you go with that. And then com some communities felt that when the governor came back and said, I want everybody open, they felt a little bit sort of caught unawares. And I think the state could have done a better job, again, of providing the data up front with that, what they were using to make decisions about that, engage in that community education with school districts and hear from them what kind of resources their communities need in order to move forward with opening. Those pieces are really key to engaging the community in the decision. And I feel badly that they weren't in place because I think they altered the context for how the decision is being made. Um, and again, I just wanna stress, this isn't an answer. This is just sort of another way of looking at the way we communicate data and how much data we provide and, in, and how we provide it so that we can show what data, how it's important and what decisions it can help us make could have maybe made this a little bit easier on Massachusetts communities than it is, I think. I think um, I'm gonna, I, I, so, not more of a question, but a general comment here in response to uh, what we're currently discussing. And I don't know if maybe perhaps panel members uh, can add to this or, uh, but the, the statement is, it is fascinating that some of the districts in low spread and um, uh, incidence areas are all virtual while in other areas with more spread schools are hybrid. It seems more fear-based than data. Is there uh, any truth to this to, um, uh, what your thoughts are on this particular comment? Now, my name's, uh, well, it's Jasmine. So I have kids in a couple of different di districts. I have one in the Adelam uh, school system and I have one in the Wilbraham school system. I chose to keep my Wilbraham child um, from Minichaw remote just because of the commute that we have to make. And uh, I allowed my Agawam Elementary School student uh, to be a participant in the hybrid model there. What I think we need to understand too is uh, when this all began, everybody was doing the best that they could in making decisions for their school district with the information they had at the time. In addition, I think we need to be very sensitive that school administrators didn't go to school necessarily to assess data uh, related to a pandemic and make decisions for our children off of that. So I think the school districts tried to make the best decisions that uh, they could make with the information that was available, but there was no 100% foolproof right or wrong answer. So hence why you will see a disparity in some schools being virtual versus some being hybrid versus some adopting a more on-site approach. This is literally a pandemic PDSA, which is a plan, do, study, act format of quality assessment and improvement. There is no rule book here. Uh, so they're doing the best they can with what they have and trying to take all of the considerations into effect. So when I decided to send my, my uh, elementary school student to the hybrid model, I did that taking in part her mental health. That child of mine is very social. Being home, first of all, she didn't like remote learning and uh, she needs a more, um, she needs more socialization and she's the youngest person in our house. Everybody else is 18, 16, and then in their 30s, and, you know, she's the Lone Ranger at nine with no interaction with anybody. So, you know, each of us are making decisions with varying pieces of information, but we're trying to do the best that we can, and I think we don't want to demonize any school district for the choices that they made. They did the best they could with what they had, and now, knowing what they know, I guarantee you they would say, I'll, I'd make this decision differently, or I would have went this way. Uh, but we made this decision, we committed to it, and we went forward. 
Thank you, Jasmine, uh, for that response. That was great. We do have three minutes, oh, two minutes left. Uh, the other question here I have, uh, will community health workers be more utilized for assisting in how our community is engaged and utilize data that can be collected from that area? I would say that I don't know that there is a specific plan um, for that, but that they would be an amazing tool in particular in the next challenge we all have. I mean, there's the current challenge of, of, of encouraging people to withstand the COVID fatigue, stay home um, and make their somehow work and remote schooling life work. But then also we have the vaccine coming up and um, helping um, community health workers have a really amazing role that they can play in uh, translating for folks um, how what their feelings are about the safety and and at and in, um, the importance of taking the vaccine you know I think that there's going to be a really important role for community level education um, to get people to feel comfortable with the vaccine and to take it so that we can all get back to school <laughs> among other things. Hey, thank you so much, Phoebe. And at this time, I got to say we have one minute left and I'm just going to wrap it up. Um, I know everyone has a lot, a lot on their plate going on and we want to get busy, uh, get going with our day. So thank you kindly to our, um, the people on our panel and everyone that showed up today, the staff at the Public Health, uh, Health Institute for um, doing the work they do and putting this together at such short notice and our executive director. Um, thank you. Uh, th thank you. Uh, very much appreciate your time and all the effort you do in our community and region. This is all being recorded. Um, I believe Kathleen will be sending that recording out to everybody that, that's here. More. Yeah, we'll be sending it out, um, I think. And it'll be posted on our website. And it'll be hosted on our website. Posted on our website. So with that being said, that wraps it up. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Bye.